Coming to you from Studio A here at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs, it's time for the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson. All right, today we're going to talk beneficial insects, uh, Stacy, and it's, you know, one thing to use them in a greenhouse setting, and many do. It's a controlled environment, and you've got controlled temperature, but it's another to count on beneficial insects in your yard. Not a bad idea to try it, but uh, I think it uh, causes confusion for people. Well, it does, because I think especially as people have gotten more and more aware of the plight of honeybees mm -hmm. and native bees, you know, just like we were talking about with Mike Connor last week, um, they think, okay, well, bees are beneficial because they pollinate. And so people tend to think of beneficial insects as pollinating insects. And yes, yes that is a benefit. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about beneficial insects in this context, what we usually mean is that they're benefiting you and that they are carnivores who are eating other insects or they are invertebrates who are eating other insects or are eating insects in your garden um, like spiders. So the benefit to you from these beneficial insects is they're doing your pest control for you. You've got it. A form of IPM. Well said, Stacy. And um, so let's talk about it and some of those beneficial insects that uh, maybe you can spot and learn more about in your landscape. Uh, everybody wants to do something. And, uh, and possibly do something that's beneficial to nature. You know, it's no different than the guy who walked out of, the, out of his house with a frog on top of his head and his neighbors laughing at him that he's got a frog on his head. And he says, you can laugh, but I haven't been bit by a mosquito in years. <laughs> I wouldn't suggest that technique. But to be successful in your landscape, you need diversity. You need some native plants. I think you need some herbs because herbs are aromatic. They're peren many are perennial, like or uh, oregano or thyme or lemon balm. Uh, and especially when they bolt, they make a, a great situation for beneficial insects. Uh, and, and those insects love flowers of cilantro or lemon balm or dill is a big one. Uh, native plants, of course, Stacy, uh, asters, joe pie weed, ironweed, uh, bee balm, milkweed, a lot of different types of plants that can draw beneficial insects to our landscapes. Well, you know, there's a common thread through a lot of the plants that you just named that people might not be aware of, and that is that they pretty much all have very small flowers. At least the little florets make up a larger inflorescence. So if you think of something like a dill flower or a cilantro flower or oregano or something like that, all of these plants, they have flowers, small flowers in clusters. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about beneficial insects, we are, for the most part, talking about some pretty tiny little guys. Yes, we are. And they can't, you know, get into a big flower and, and get the nectar. They'll drown. They'll fall right in and drown in a nectar pool, and that's no good. So all of these plants with small flowers, and you talked about bee balm, you talked about ironweed, um, and all of these other things, same exact thing. All of those plants are in the aster family, asteraceae. And their flowers, even though we look at them and think, oh, it's one flower. If you think about a daisy, you think it's a daisy flower. It's actually a whole bunch of little tiny florets arranged in that inflorescence. So from an insect point of view, that's not one flower. That's like, you know, 500 flowers and that's a, you know, a bonanza. You know, that's well said and a great point. So if you're looking to attract beneficial insects to your landscape, look for those types of flowers, uh, which are kind of complicated flowers because uh, many numerous florets, as you said. Stacy, I wanted to ask you how you feel about bug food. Of course, you can go online and you can buy beneficial insects. And then some of these sites will recommend that you use bug food. Essentially, you take sticks in your garden and you paste this uh, bug food, which is some of them call it weast paste. In other words, whey and yeast and sugar and brushing them on these sticks. There's recipes out there. How do you feel about that? I mean, how I feel about it is that flowers are more fun. Yes. <laughs> so, so you would really only need to do that if you didn't have flowers. And a lot of times, especially like in a greenhouse situation, if you are releasing beneficial insects to help prey on aphids or mm -hmm. spider mites or whatever, um, then you might need that because you might not have anything in flower to sure. feed the adults. And that's the key when we talk about beneficial insects, what we're mostly talking about are insects that from their larval stage or their baby stage, those 
that stage preys on insects or spider mites. And the adults, you want them to stick around and have their babies in your garden and they eat flowers. So uh -huh. that's a big difference. So you need to have that food source for the adults in order for them to be like, hey, it's cool here. I can settle. There's food, there's shelter. You know, I like it here. If you don't have that, if you don't have flowers, which can happen in a greenhouse or depending on your garden, you know, you get them in in spring and you don't have a lot of stuff blooming or stuff not suitable to these tiny little guys, then, yeah, you might need to to provide some supplemental food like that. So let me segue off what you just spoke about. Ladybugs. Yeah. Ladybugs uh, dealing with aphids. And of course, you have the Asian ladybugs and then you have the native uh, ladybugs, which uh, generally hang out in leaf litter. The Asian ladybugs tend to hang out in your house over winter. Oh, yeah. And they operate in clusters. But the point is, is the larva almost looks like tiny little alligators. And that's where they do their damage. Yeah. And, you know, so many people will see a ladybug larva for the first time and freak yes. out. <laughs> what is this in my garden? Is it bad? So we'll put a picture, of course, on the YouTube uh, version of the show if you're able to see that, or of course you can just search for it. Um, but yeah, I've heard alligator, I've heard dragon, people use all sorts of creative names. So basically, you know, I remember being a little kid and having some sort of little insect land on me and be like, mom, it's a baby ladybug. Well, no, it's not a baby ladybug because a baby ladybug does not look like Correct. an adult ladybug. It's a kind of wormy alligator looking thing. It is orange and black. It's kind of spiky. Mm -hmm. I, I imagine yeah. people are getting some wild imagination. Looks you know, like something out of a right Steven Spielberg movie. Yeah, yeah. it does. It kind of looks like yeah. it could be an alien or, yeah. or something creepy like that. But mm -hmm. they have a voracious appetite yes. for aphids, especially. I mean, the adults will eat some, but those adult ladybugs, again, they're going for the nectar. It's those uh, those larvae that you really need to feed. That's what's, what's doing your pest control for you. And I think in future weeks, uh, we should dive in deep in regards to this subject. I know, Stacy, uh, you know a lot about insects and love insects, uh, and, and I don't blame you. I do too. Uh, you know, if we go down the list, there's beneficial nematodes where we're generally dealing with insects in the soil, yep. larva. Uh, you have lace wings, parasitic wasps. I always, in summertime, love to watch the work of parasitic wasps when they lay their eggs on tomato hornworms. Oh, yeah. See, I have not wow. seen that yet. I've seen pictures of it. But, you know, people think wasps, whoa, 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 wasps could never be beneficial. <laughs> uh, and wasps can be a predator of desirable uh, insect larvae as well. Um, so it is important to know that some of these insects that are considered beneficial insects are really kind of non-discriminate when it comes to eating. So they can eat some beneficials. But, you know, you're talking about a wasp that if you have a tomato hornworm, which... You know, I'll, I'll just come right out and say it. Tomato hornworms are the only insect that truly freaks me out. <laughs> <laughs> they really do. They're so big. They've eaten so much of your tomato. I do not like them. I can't bring myself to squish them. If I find one, I fling it into my driveway and let the birds get it. But yeah, sometimes if you get lucky, you will find one that's all covered in white eggs. Mm -hmm. And basically what that is, is the larva or the eggs of parasitic wasps. And when those eggs hatch... Those larvae are going to go into the insect body, devour it, it and out. burst open mm -hmm. as adult wasps to repeat the cycle. I've posted pictures in social media and people uh, freak out. Yeah. So it's, it's crazy. <laughs> Uh, you have the uh, tachinid fly. Yep. I love the scientific name for that thing, Bombyliopsis abrupta, something like that. <laughs> we'll post it, or maybe Adriana will put it on the YouTube video. Uh, ho hover flies, and I I struggle with that word, Stacy. I never know if it's hover or hover or hover or hoover. So I always said it. it was hover. Okay. You know, because they're hovering. I'm going to take your word so. for it. So surfid flies. Surf, I usually say surfid flies mm -hmm. anyway because it's more fun to say. And I don't know. I just, I always say surfid flies. But sur another way that people can think about these is they're bee flies because they do mm -hmm. use a bee mimicry. So they look like bees, yep. but they are flies. And you can tell the difference because the surfid fly has two wings. So flies have two wings. Bees have four wings. Uh, so if you're able to observe it and you only see the two wings, that is a surfid fly. It's beneficial. Again, going back to that larval stage, loves to eat all sorts of nasty stuff uh, and, and does a great job. And I find the adults really quite delightful and I love seeing them. I grow a lot of um, fennel, ornamental fennel, sure. and they love those flowers. 
Yeah, eats lots of nats- nasty stuff. That's like some <laughs> teenagers I know <laughs> who can still do that at their age. Praying mantis, uh, rove beetles uh, are fascinating. Uh, learn more about them. There's so many that we could talk about. And I love the leafhopper assassin bugs. Oh, my word, are they very cool also. Uh, so... Oh, with a uh, name and, like Assassin Bug, it's got to be cool. Well, and part of the reason <laughs> they call them Assassin Bug is because they're predatory in all stages. Uh-huh. And that's the interesting thing, as you mentioned, the ladybugs just in the larva stage. But with Assassin Bugs, they named them appropriately. Well, we'll see how Stacy ties this all in in Plants on Trial coming up in our next segment here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show, where we are talking about one of my all-time favorite subjects, insects. I love them. (laughs) I love seeing them. I love talking about them. I love learning about them, and I love sharing the few things that I do know about them, because just like plants, learning about insects is opens a whole new world that you couldn't even begin to master. Now, we didn't uh, mention in the first episode... In the first segment, when we were talking about beneficials, you didn't mention one of my absolute favorite beneficial insects. And what one would that be? Lacewings. Oh, lacewings, you're right. Yes. So I love lacewings. They are beautifully elegant as an adult. So they have this sort of uh, gorgeous, glowing lime green color. And they're one of the larger, I would say, of the um, of the beneficial insects. And their their wings really are very lacy and light and see through and delicate. So beautiful adult. But what I really love about them is the eggs. And when, once you know what a lacewing egg looks like, you do start to find them everywhere. And they're typically on the underside of the leaves. Mm-hmm. And they are they're just this fine sort of little hair like structure with this elegant little egg at the end. So they they lay their eggs on these stalks. And they are typically in groups of like maybe five to 10 or something like that. Now, again, this is another case where those larvae are doing much more benefit to you in terms of eating Mm -hmm. aphids and all these other, uh, you know, uh, negative insects in your garden. Um, But whether you have the eggs or the adults, I think they are just so lovely. And I do want to say, don't get lace uh, wing confused with lace bug. Because lace bug is a bad insect for your garden. Some uh, plants are much more susceptible to it than others. Of course, the azalea lace bug is a notorious one. Sycamore and London plain also get a lace bug. And lace bugs are not beneficial. They actually suck plant juices and can cause some ugly, you know, coloration on your plant leaves. But lace wings... Totally good. Welcome in. Roll out the welcome mat for Mm. the lace wings in your garden. So in bug talk, the lesser of two weevils. Yeah, I guess so. I guess you could say that, although they are not in the weevil. Weevils are type of beetle. So. Sorry, you know, I'm going to get a little pedantic. For a bug pun. <laughs> I'm going to get a little pedantic when it comes to bugs. You know, I know I'm, you I'm are. very passionate about this. Well, let's have it. <laughs> <laughs> so, as we we're saying, whatever uh, you know, beneficial insect that you are um, trying to encourage in your garden, and I, I do want to say this, um, we should mention this. You can buy beneficial insects. Those are very often sold for use in a greenhouse or something like that. But typically for most of us as gardeners, we don't need to buy them. All we really need to do is make our gardens more hospitable for them to take up residence and they'll find it on their own. These are native for the most part insects um, that just, they're just around. The environment. Yeah. And would you agree with me, Stacy, that dill is a good choice? Dill is not? a great choice. Okay. The All only right. problem with dill is that it blooms for a relatively short time. Right. I mean, I love dill right. flowers. I love dill. Mm-hmm. But dill is a plant, you know, again, we've talked a bit about cilantro on, I, I know we're in plants on trial and I'm about to go off on some major tangent here. But, <laughs> you know, people think because of how they buy dill in the grocery store, that it's going to grow one way and it doesn't grow that way. It's the same with cilantro. So in the garden, dill is very lush and leafy early in the season. Mm -hmm. And then as summer comes on and it gets ready to flower, those leaves kind of peter out and you just get that long flowering stem. Great for pickles. Perfect timing for when the, the cucumbers really start to come in the garden. But really, to have a steady supply of dill, you need to keep sowing the seed, have continuous sowing so that it's always coming up because it just naturally has that that short life cycle. But talking about dill and having that relatively short flowering time is the perfect segue into today's plant on trial, which is lo and behold, blue chip junior butterfly bush. I love that plant. Yeah, I love it too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, 
butterfly bushes, Budlia, get all the attention for attracting butterflies. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's right there in the name. So kind of clear why that would happen. And yes, they do attract butterflies. But the same reason that butterflies are attracted to them are the same reasons that beneficial insects would be attracted to these plants. Mm -hmm. They have numerous small flowers, a very high pollen and nectar count. And the great thing about adding, now this is true of any butterfly bush, but I'm focusing specifically on lo and behold, blue chip junior today. And I'll give you some reasons why in a moment. But the great thing about having a butterfly bush as part of this approach to encouraging beneficial insects is that they flower for months. You know, typically for us here in Michigan, butterfly bushes are in flower pretty much from like mid June all the way up through mid September, even late September, depending on how the weather goes. Compare that with dill where you're going to have maybe, you know, two weeks of rich nectar flowers. Compare that even to something like you were talking about milkweed. We talked about bee balm, fantastic flowers, but again, usually only around for two or three weeks in the summer. So I think it brings up the point, diversity is important. So you can plant the herbs and that sort of thing. But your point is with butterfly bush that uh, all those tiny little flowers, uh, the insects love them and it's, uh, it does the heavy work the heavy lifting, because it's blooming for such a long period of time. Right. So it's kind of like having this all-you-can-eat buffet all summer long. It's open 24-7. 24-7. And then, you know, if they're like, hey, you know, I'm getting a little tired of having Budlia for dinner every day. <laughs> uh, oh, but look, hey, the, the bee balm went and blooms. Exactly. So I'm going to go, go switch it up. So, again, it's so important. And this is the great thing about this is it's just as beneficial for you from an aesthetic standpoint as it is for, for the insects to have this broad diversity of flower colors, forms, times, different nectar contents, different pollen contents. And so butterfly bush are just part of that equation. Preach it. You're on a roll, Stacey. <laughs> so we have a bunch of butterfly bush in the Proven Winners Color Choice line. So of course, choosing just one to cover today is, is always difficult. But I wanted to choose Lo and Behold Blue Chip Junior. So Lo and Behold Butterfly Bushes came out about maybe 15-ish years ago. And they were the first uh, non-invasive seedless butterfly bushes I on remember. the market. Yep. And not only were they seedless and non-invasive, and we probably have listeners right now going, wait, what? Butterfly bush is invasive. And it's not typically an issue here in Michigan, but in, especially in milder climates, yep. um, because butterfly bush had become so popular and older varieties are very seedy, put out a lot of seed. Like if you go out west to Oregon or Washington, you are going to see butterfly bush growing in the ditches like we have purple loose strife. It's a kind of a wild thing to see if you're not used to that. And especially if you uh, garden in clay soil and are thinking, sheesh, I can't even get a butterfly bush to live in my yard, much less imagine it being invasive. So for a lot of gardeners, having this seedless quality is really important and has made butterfly bush an opportunity again in areas where it was banned because these particular varieties don't set seed. But that doesn't mean that they don't have nectar, that they don't have pollen. They still have all of that capability of sustaining not just butterflies, but other beneficial insects sure. as well. So the original butterfly, uh, lo and behold, blue chip was kind of a larger plant. The colors were kind or the flower color was more of like a dusty kind of blue. So the same breeder, Dr. Dennis Warner out of North Carolina State University, he's retired now, but he devoted his career to developing sterile non-invasive butterfly bushes. Um, he selected this one later because it has a much richer blue color. And what I really like about this particular variety is that the foliage is kind of silvery. So most of the other ones have a dark green leaf, which is still fine. Um, but I think this one just has that, like, I love that Mediterranean kind of drought tolerant look. Good description. Yeah, exactly. So I love that color in there. So I really like the contrast between the flowers and foliage of Lo and Behold Blue Chip Junior Butterfly Bush. It's also a little bit smaller than the original blue chip. So it reaches just one and a half to two and a half feet tall and wide. And that's pretty revolutionary for a butterfly bush because older varieties are like what? eight feet tall and, you know, feet five, <laughs> five feet wide. So they would get really, really large. And so uh, Dr. Warner's breeding with the Lo and Behold series really kind of helped people reimagine butterfly bush and how it could be used 
in the garden. And I think this is such a great example of it. Another thing about this one is it is less brittle than other butterfly bush. And butterfly bush, you know, most plants have some liability somewhere in there. You might not discover it depending on how you're using it. But butterfly bush, the wood is just naturally brittle. And so, you know, very often if you've ever purchased one and you're bringing it home from the garden center, uh, you know, it's like breaking off. You think, oh, geez, I just ruined it. Well, it's just something that happens with with these particular plants. Um, so a lot of improvements over it, but I did say I want to um, talk about some of the tips about butterfly bush since it is spring and a lot of people are probably wondering what they do and pruning of course is always a huge, huge issue. So yes, you can prune your butterfly bush and in fact you should prune your butterfly bush because if you don't, you will end up with a second story plant that flowers only at the tippy top where you can't even really see it, still fine for butterflies and beneficial insects, but not so great for you. And it doesn't really look that great either. But the time to prune your butterfly bush is when you see the new growth emerging on the stems. So whenever that happens, that's your signal to prune. Butterfly bush are one of those plants where it's not super clear where you should be pruning. It doesn't have really obvious bud points like some other plants like hydrangeas or roses do. So if you wait until that new growth is actually emerging on the stem, it's telling you, hey, you can prune me here. I'm alive below this. We're good to go. And what you want to do is prune just above where a large bud is emerging. The bigger the bud, the more vigorous the growth that comes from it is. And you want to try to cut them pretty low, about as low to the ground as you can and still just above a bud because this is going to give you that nice, compact, dense habit like you see in the pictures on our tags. That's how we take care of all of our butterfly bushes here at the nursery. And um, that will also help you get good flower coverage all over the plant. Now, if you don't see new growth emerging on your butterfly bush, even if everything else in your yard is emerging, don't panic. They can be very, very late to emerge in spring. They can actually take all the way until mid-June, especially if you live in a colder climate. You know, I have so much more to say about this. I, I <laughs> you, you know, bugs, butterfly bush, I'm dying over here. So I'm going to put the rest of this in the show notes because we have to take a little bit of break. So visit gardeningsimplifiedonair.com for all the information you need. When we come back, we're opening up the garden mailbag. So please stay tuned. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show, where it's the time to answer your garden questions. If you've got a garden question, you can reach us at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. It's so easy. You just click the contact tab and send us your message. And I know some people have mentioned that they had trouble attaching photos, which very often when you're helping people diagnose gardening issues, a photo is very important. If that's the case, just go ahead and write us and say, I couldn't attach my photo, and we'll give you further instructions from there. But I know it's a busy time of year. We got a lot of questions in the inbox. So what do we got on tap this week? Well, along the lines of questions, Stacy, I just wanted to mention to you, your comments about pruning Budlea were very, very good. Uh, and I did live radio for years and that was one of the number one questions oh, yeah. I'd get, pruning Budlea. So. Right, because they look kind of crummy in spring. And you're exactly. going, no, oh, I can't possibly be meant to look at this for the next couple of weeks. And we want to get started. <laughs> All right. Angie writes to us a couple of weeks ago, I noticed my indoor Meyer lemon tree had spider mites. Surprise. And uh, this is the first time I've ever grown a Meyer lemon tree. First time I've ever experienced a pest. And I fear I noticed too late to save it. So Angie applied some safers end all the leaves have fallen off. Now there's just branches, any chance of survival or is it set for the compost pile? And Stacy, uh, anytime that I hear the word mites, I think dry air, dry air. And if we bring a lemon tree inside the house and the heat is running and I'm not sure where Angie lives, uh, but it could be air conditioning too, dry yeah. air. You're going to have mite problems. Yeah, and I think that, you know, what can happen, especially at this time of the year, the plant has been indoors for what, you know, six months now, five months? That's a long time, and that's really going to start adding up and causing the plant a lot of stress. Stressful. And when a plant is under stress, pest problems really explode. They can be 
managed just fine all season long. But then if you get some kind of major stress, boom, it just kind of explodes with them. So I think that's what happened, Angie, that your plant just kind of is like, can't take it anymore. I'm giving up. The spider mites won. But that doesn't mean your plant is dead. When a plant is very stressed, it's not at all uncommon for it to just be like, nope, these leaves aren't doing me any good. They're way too bitten up by spider mites. I'm just going to like grow a whole new set. I'm going to go mope for a while. <laughs> I'm going to mope. I'm going I'm to regroup my energy and I'm going to hopefully be able to get new foliage out when conditions improve. So the great news, Angie, is I do think it's likely to be okay. I think that just the fact that the leaves were all dropped doesn't mean that it's suffering. It just means that it's stressed and kind of conserving its resources and, you know, probably has some sense based on the increasing light that better days are ahead. My recommendation for you would be to put it outdoors as soon as you reasonably can without risking, you know, its health to any cold. This plant is going to be so, so much happier outside than inside. And I think that, you know, as you water it and uh, make it happy again, it will leaf out. I have certainly had citrus plants that I've attempted to grow indoors. I've never had bright enough light to really do it well that have defoliated like that and taken a little break and then with water and, you know, longer days and all of that come back without a problem. So do not give up on it. Uh, and then maybe next year, you know, maybe some misting, um, maybe a preemptive application of this safe spray that you put on uh, to try to control any mites that might be coming in on the plant when you bring it in in winter. Move away from any registers when it's yeah. indoors, but two words, sunshine and humidity. But what do I know? I'm only humid. <laughs> I love humid weather. So do lemon trees. Cheryl has a question. I purchased uh, rooted plants of asparagus Jersey Giant and asparagus Mary Washington. My question, where should I plant them? The package says to plant in full sun to create a mound in the trench and spreading the roots over the ridge. The only thing I do understand is that do not harvest the spears <laughs> the first year. And, you know, this is a great question because asparagus is a perennial vegetable, just like horseradish or rhubarb. The plants can last for years. And, yes, uh, when we see the spears in spring and in ensuing years, uh, once that's done, to let that fern-like foliage grow, Stacy, and, I love and the allow foliage. the plant to, yeah, to photosynthesize the plant the foliage is so beautiful so yeah that's why the typical recommendation is to not harvest the first year because the spears that you eat in asparagus are actually the, the shoots for the mm -hmm. foliage so if you take those off the plant doesn't have an opportunity to grow foliage to photosynthesize and increase the size of that crown so i'm not exactly sure where your confusion is cheryl unless it's about the trench because this is kind of standard recommendation mm -hmm. for asparagus and if you've ever seen an asparagus root crown it's kind of like a octopus or yes, something like a very exactly. a very tangled ball of yarn uh octopus with a crown yeah that's what it is and so that trench recommendation is really so that you can kind of position the crown and try to spread those roots out the best that you can now this isn't like the kind of thing that you got to fuss over and work really hard at but the the typical way that it should be planted is to dig a wider hole and then as you place those crowns into the trench take the time to kind of spread out the roots and uh, that will really help it to establish better. And I'll tell you, it's worth whatever you put into establishing an asparagus planting because yeah, they'll last 30 years or longer. They're exactly. very, very long lived. And more important than the trench, in my opinion, is well-drained soil. So they need moisture, some organic material. We can work in some manure, organic material, but you need well-drained soil with asparagus. The soil pH is important also. They don't like really acidic soils uh, so maybe get a ph test you don't have to but they do like that 6.5 range and then uh, side dressing the rows with some 12 12 12 works great uh, but that drainage part is important and sun so you definitely and want sun. you know your direction said six hours of sun that doesn't have to be all at once necessarily like in one block it can be throughout the day but you definitely want six hours. And Cheryl, if you happen to be here in West Michigan along with us, you've got great conditions for asparagus yes. as the many, many asparagus yes. farms in our area can attest. Yeah, absolutely. Now we got a question from another Cheryl who says, I have an oak leaf hydrangea that is about three, has been in my garden for three years, never bloomed. I bought this variety because I was told it would do well in a shady area. 
can you advise? One of my favorite plants, oak leaf hydrangea. Me too. Such a great plant. And I do generally consider oak leaf hydrangeas the most shade tolerant yes. of hydrangeas. But there are a couple of reasons your plant might not be blooming. Now, number one, I don't know what size you started with. So if you started with a really small, like one quart plant that you would buy by mail order, it certainly just needs more time, you know, to, to mature and be able to, to grow. Uh, if you have deer, very often deer don't cause a lot of problems, a lot of damage to the plant, but they love to just nip out that flower bud, especially like in winter or spring. So if you have deer, you might not be noticing a lot of damage, but they could have eaten it. Squirrels will do it too. Oh, they will? Yeah, they will. Oh, I didn't know. They'll munch on them. They're, they're so cute, but they can be <laughs> they can be very destructive. Sorry. No, that's okay. I, I, I do. I have a very soft spot in my heart for squirrels. Um, or, of course, if you're pruning it. So I a soft spot <laughs> They're so cute. <laughs> they are lovable little you know, fuzzballs. I, I stand by my point that if squirrels were not so ubiquitous, people would be lining up to go to zoos that had squirrels. Like, they're so cute and so you know, fun to watch. Point. Acrobatic. Yeah, they're great to watch. People would, they would be like a meme. You know, people would love them so much and, and say all these great things about them, but they're ubiquitous and so people ignore them. But And don't we're coming squirrels. off a masked year, so we've got them everywhere yeah. right now. They're having a grand old time in my yard. Yes, they are. Uh, so anyway, if you're pruning, oak leaf hydrangeas do bloom on old wood. So that means that you should not prune them or else you'll be cutting off the flower buds. So um, I hope one of those makes sense to you, Cheryl. Of course, we'll put this all in the show notes at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. All right. Great. Uh, Marie, wondering, my iris leaves get brown streaks in them. What is wrong with them? Is there a way to prevent this from happening? A classic question. A classic question. Now, there are some fungal diseases that irises can get, and I will put some links in the show notes for those too. But almost certainly, in my experience, the number one reason that your iris is going to have streaky foliage is the dreaded iris borer. Bingo. Yep. Horrible little thing. I mean, I love bugs. You know, the we've miserable. already been through that. This is a moth and it's larva. In this case, very not beneficial larva. Mm -hmm. um, it lays its eggs. Uh, the moth lays its eggs sort of at the base of the iris and they hatch out. And then the caterpillars go into the iris foliage, which is what causes those streaks. And then when they're about ready to pupate, they go down into the rhizome. They make a sticky, a slimy, mess. horrible mess of your iris rhizomes. So I'd say this is most likely what this is. The best time to scout for iris borer is in July. So you want to get out there and look around. They even recommend if you do have iris borer that you dig up your clump look through all of the rhizomes, you will very clearly see if you have iris borer, because again, they just make it into this disgusting, slimy mess. Take out any that have it, of course, crush any of those caterpillars that you see in your rhizomes, and then replant your rhizomes. The iris will be none the worse for it. Um, and then of course, when uh, fall comes and you've had your frost, at that point, you wanna make sure you remove and discard all of your iris foliage because that will really help to control any pests or any, you know, eggs that are in the actual foliage or on the foliage itself. Right? Absolutely. You have anything to add? No, you nailed it. <laughs> anyway, Marie, we have uh, lots of information about this to help you diagnose them, understand what to do and recognize them for Marie or anyone else who is struggling with iris or they are very, very common, very widespread. I barely have any irises in my yard and I've had them most every year. So I know the feeling. So anyway, thank you all so much for your questions. If you have a question, you can always reach us at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we've got branching news. So stay tuned. Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's time for branching news. And right off the top, just want to introduce folks who are not aware of the plant to a plant that's been around for a long time. Stacy's going to help me with the botanical name. I'm going to take a shot at it. Cyanothus americanus. Yeah, Cyanothus. Close enough. Yep. Okay, good. Also known as New Jersey tea. Now, I love this native plant because it was used as a black tea substitute during the Revolutionary War when they had that little party there in Boston, that Boston Tea Party, and pitched it all over the side. And they're like, wow, well, now what do we do? And that's when they used the leaves of New Jersey tea plant. And it kept the colonist grumpy uh, because, Stacy, there is not caffeine in those leaves, but they used it as a substitute. 
Well, back in Revolutionary War times, they were pretty much desperate for anything remotely palatable <laughs> that they could ingest. So I have not tried it myself, but it is a beautiful native plant. I have tried to grow it, and I have found out that my yard is a little bit too dry for it. Okay. Um, but I do love it. It has white flowers that attract a ton of pollinators, an interesting texture on the foliage. And if you're sitting there going, hmm, Ceanothus, that sounds familiar. We have a number of other native Ceanothus in North America, but most of them are native to California. Not remotely hardy, but super popular landscape plants out in California. Gorgeous. Sometimes they're even called California lilac because they're just covered in these like hazy, billowy masses of purple flowers. So pretty. We can't grow those here in the in the Midwest, but we can grow New Jersey tea. And it's still a very cool plant with a very cool story. There you go. So put it on your radar. Another thing to put on your radar, invaders from the underground are coming this summer in Cicada Geddon. Yeah, it's the biggest bug emergence in centuries. This spring, an unusual cicada double dose is about to invade a couple parts of the United States in what they're calling Cicada Geddon. And uh, the last time these two broods came out together, 1803, Thomas Jefferson wrote about them. He uh, referred to them as locusts. Uh, but there's some pretty big broods coming out, as I've seen it, Stacy, uh, Georgia and Illinois being the epicenter, as I understand it. Yeah, we're not predicted to get much here in okay. Michigan. Uh, so... Hopefully peaceful summer nights ahead for us, but not so much for our neighbors. <laughs> you know, it's quite a topic for people to talk about. And uh, this week, as opposed to a limerick, uh, I got these two limericks from the Washington Post, Ooh. who invited people to write about cicadas. Uh, there was one, uh, cicadas, a hard word to rhyme. It's not one you hear all the time. But try, ra try rhyming echo skeleton, only a clever fella can. So glad to be on the last line. <laughs> Great sense of humor there. Great job. Another one, life is short, no time to waste. Sleep for years, then date in haste. Flex those muscles, shed that jacket, find a mate, cause a racket. Oh, yeah, that's, that is a cicada, cicada's MO right there. <laughs> I like it. This next story, stick around. This is going to be good. So uh, for those of you who are on Instagram, I suggest you look up official stick reviews. Uh, I follow that account. It has 45.9 thousand followers started about a year ago. And I love the names of the gentlemen who started the account. Uh, one, his name is Boone Hogg and the other is Logan Juggler. And uh, they all just kind of as a joke, they loved collecting sticks when they go hiking and they're thinking, wow, this is a really cool stick or this is a cool quality stick. This one feels really good in my hand. Uh, and they started posting these and they found that there were a bunch of other people like me who love collecting sticks for whatever crazy reason. And, uh, and then we rate sticks on their quality. Now, I brought along a couple sticks here. Oh, I wonder what, do you have a rating for that? Oh. Well, uh, these aren't rated. These are walking sticks. So this is uh, driftwood out of uh, Lake Michigan. Oh, that and is a sturdy stick. Exactly. And I even taped them for you, you know, safety first. Uh, so one for Adriana and one for you, a walking stick. Uh, these guys uh, on a hike in Moab, Utah, they filmed their first stick review and posted it online. And I was thinking uh, we as gardeners... Um, would appreciate and love sticks too. And this thing has gotten out of control. They now have the McMurray bend test. They have the Tennyson curve scale, uh, the Williams Wacker meter, uh, all of these different variations to test the sticks. They have stick of the month, a tournament at the start of each month and people post uh, these sticks. Great webs, uh, great site to visit on Instagram and follow. Yeah, I'm definitely going to add it to my list. I was just trying to look for it. I didn't find it, so I'm going to have to do a little more digging. But I am excited to follow the official stick reviews because yeah. who doesn't like a good stick? Yeah, so Adriana, have some fun walking out there with your stick, too. What do you call a boomerang that doesn't come back? A stick. <laughs> what do you call a magic wand that doesn't do magic? A stick, right? So... Anyhow. Do you know the stick on the ground song? 
No, I don't. Oh, Adriana is a big fan. So uh, <laughs> I, I will not do a rendition, but we will, we will share the link for the Stick on the Ground song in the show notes. I love it. Found oh my God, stick I on the ground, and now I'm <laughs> gonna use it. All this power that I found, gonna totally abuse it. Dude, I hit it so much stuff, and I'm kicking to my weight because I found a stick, and I'm using it today. I got a stick, got a stick. <laughs> Where there's a willow, there's a way, right? There you go. I'm, I'm gonna stick with my dad jokes. <laughs> That's what I'm gonna do. All right, rats are not a mice thing to have in your house uh, in Boston. Rat traps are getting a new look thanks to some local artists. Uh, an art festival in Boston is looking to bring some beauty to the neighborhood's rat problem. They're paying artists $100 to decorate rat traps that will be placed in the area, and the event is aptly named the Rat City Art Festival. So if you're looking for something that's... Uh, well, kind of ratical. I'm sorry I had to do that this summer. Uh, Boston's the place, the Rat City Art Festival. Well, having lived in New York City and been a horticulturist in New York City, I have <laughs> had more than my share of run-ins with rats. Yes. So. so I doubt you're going to go. I mean, I'm okay with them. <laughs> I mean, you, the, the feeling of a rat running over your shoe is not one that you forget. But, uh, yeah, I, I have many rat memories. <laughs> All right. Well, let's move from rats to ground. Not in my house, fortunately. Never had them indoors, <laughs> but funny outdoors. Uh, Punxsutawney Phil. You know, we always talk about Punxsutawney in early February, whether or not Punxsutawney sees its shadow. Well, Phil and Phyllis have had uh, babies. I'm just announcing that. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. So Phil Jr.? Uh, a couple of Phil Juniors, I guess. And I don't know if someday they'll inherit the mantle and be able to predict whether or not spring has arrived. But they had uh, they had babies. So um, pretty cool. Yeah, cute little groundhog babies. Only have to work one day a week, 364 days. It's, <laughs> it's kind of a, a, a great gig. Nice so. work if you can get it. Nice work if you can get it. All right. <laughs> You know, it makes me makes me think of a polar bear who walks into a bar and he says to the bartender, I'll have a rum and a Coke. And the bartender says, why the big paws? And the polar bear says, well, I was born with those. <laughs> Sorry. See, I, I earned the right to do bad dad jokes, okay? I'm old enough to do them. Have you ever heard of jacket potatoes? Oh, yes, I have. In the United Kingdom? Really? Oh, okay. in the in the United Kingdom? Oh. Well, jacket potatoes. They call it like baked potato, right? Yes. Like it's, it's got the skin on. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in the United Kingdom, England, they, uh, they love their baked potatoes, and a lot of people feel that they do it best. So as opposed to uh, taking a, a potato that you're going to bake and poking holes in it, so it doesn't explode, and then probably, what, 400 degrees for an hour or something like that to bake the potatoes. In, uh, in England, what they do is they slice the potato. They almost make a cross in the center, uh, and then they uh, bake them for much longer, mm. maybe two hours at 400 degrees. The whole concept, the whole idea is to have them crispy on the outside, and fluffy on the inside. And as I understand it, in England, uh, these jacket potatoes are the best baked potato you can have. Oh, now, see, my father-in-law is a devotee of the long-cooked potato school. I want to hear about that. Oh, yes. He has a special clay pot where he <laughs> makes them and cooks them for, yeah, at least two hours. He loves that, like, super fluffy inside. Now, usually yes. he burns the outside, so it's not really edible. It's like coal. But, you know, you sometimes when he does them on the grill, you really only get like one little scoop out of the potato. The rest is all incinerated. That is his favorite way to eat them. So I have had this type of potato many, many times myself. Outstanding. I love that. <laughs> so I'm going to try this jacket potatoes. I'm just being a commentator here to close out our show. It's been fun, Stacy. Yeah, wait, I have a question on the potato thing. Yeah. So I usually microwave them because I don't like to waste that much energy, you know, to, <laughs> to just like bake two potatoes. So I usually microwave them to get a head start. Do you think that's permitted in the jacket potato, you know? I would say no. Okay. I would All say right. no. We're going for that crispy outside. No hacks in the jacket potato it. world. Okay, I got you. 
Hey, Stacy, it's been a kick in the plants. Thank you, Adriana, and thank you, Stacy. Most of all, thanks to you for watching us on YouTube, listening to us on radio, and enjoying our podcast. Have a great week.